Once upon a time, computers were nothing more than boring text terminals. A far cry from the modern operating systems with colorful and animated UIs we know from today. Despite the inconvenient user interface that required users to first climb a steep learning curve, it was clear to industry leaders that we were at the beginning of the personal computer revolution. Well, Paul Allen, my co-founder, and I wrote down uh, that we see a, a computer on every desk and in every home. Microsoft was one of the companies competing in the market of graphical operating systems, which promised to set new standards in terms of user-friendliness. Gone was the time when one had to read through hundreds of pages of explanations to be able to use a command-based operating system. In today's video, we are going to explore a software product from around 1990, which brought flashy animations to Windows 3.1. After Dark. But before we get into the details, let's quickly go over the hardware and operating systems we are going to use today. Here is my trusted AMD 386DX40, a rather unspectacular system with one exception. It has access to a massive amount of 32MB of system memory. A faulty 32MB module triggered my curiosity and I spent hours on researching computer memory, which led to multiple videos on my channel. Long story short, after very helpful input from the community, an altered design of an existing 30-pin SIM PCB, I held a couple of 4MB modules in my hand that could force EDO memory chips to operate in FPM mode. And this is how I ended up with a total of 32MB of system memory. Apart from that, we are going to use an ISA graphics card, an ISA I.O. controller and an ISA sound card. The Sound Blaster 2.0, which you may have seen in my last video. As a hard drive, I'm going to use a compact flash card for the very first time. I usually use SD cards for storage. However, this 386 BIOS is limited to accessing drives with a maximum capacity of around 500MB only. This 128MB compact flash card will be perfect for installing MS-DOS 6.22 as well as Windows 3.1. The BIOS detects the drive and reports a usable capacity of around 120MB. This compact flash card was pulled from an unknown electronic device of which I found the PCB at the scrapyard. So I have no idea what it was used for. FDisk reports 4 partitions, which we will delete to get the full capacity in one drive. MS-DOS 6.22 is limited to FAT16 partitions, which will be good enough for our 120MB flash card. But before we can install MS-DOS, we need to format the drive. And then, after the installation completed successfully and a reboot, I was greeted with Grub. Luckily, I could resolve this quite quickly after a bit of research. It turns out that some compact flash cards may have issues with the master boot record. The command fdisk forward slash mbr fixed it and I could finally boot into DOS. Remember the 100 pages of manual to read and the steep learning curve? It would have taken me a lot more time to resolve this if it weren't for the internet. Anyway, now MS-DOS boots properly and we can continue with the installation of Windows 3.1. Unfortunately, Windows only ships with Sound Blaster 1.0 and 1.5 drivers out of the box. However, it is not too difficult to find the correct driver package for Windows 3.1. So let's make sure our audio hardware is set up correctly, just in case After Dark supports sound or music. After the installation, we can quickly test if everything is working properly by using a diagnostics utility. 8-bit testing. I 
I guess we are ready to install After Dark. This floppy disk, containing a German version of After Dark as it seems, is still in its original packaging. Based on the text at the back of this package, this software bundle contains 36 screensavers. And if we believe the marketing on the cover, we should forget about any other screensavers. Well, Microsoft Windows 3.1 comes with a handful of pre-installed screensavers that many of you may remember. The flying Windows logo screensaver was one that I have seen multiple times on my dad's 286. But my favorite was Starfield, where you could also adjust the number of stars. So let's install After Dark and see if their claim holds true and we really should forget about any other screensavers. Based on the printed instructions, we just need to access our disk drive and execute the install application. And then this very primitive installer opens up. It takes a while and then it just exits once the copy process is complete. Unfortunately, there are no new icons or program groups created in the program manager. Luckily, there is a built-in Windows tool that allows you to set up newly installed applications. It works by scanning predefined folders and allows you to create a new program group with a link to the application. And if you are lucky, the application comes with a nice looking icon. And here it is, After Dark. The program files of After Dark were copied to the Windows directory by the way. After we open the After Dark application, we get this little control window. A small configuration utility where you can select from many different screensavers. Depending on the selected screensaver, you get different configuration possibilities on the right panel. So let's have a look at a medley of screensavers of After Dark. Now that you have seen many screensavers of After Dark, which was initially released for Macintosh, let's understand why this program was so well received and why people were willing to spend 50 US dollars for a copy. First, some of the screensavers bundled in After Dark had animations not seen on 286 or 386 systems. After Dark showcased compelling computer animations when almost nothing else did. Yes, there are a few simpler screensavers included that are similar to what Windows ships with. However, others are by far more creative and an eye-catcher to anyone walking by your monitor. The aquarium for instance, with seaweed and different creatures, brings some sort of life to your screen. Another important contributor to After Dark's success was its reliability and stability. The screensavers just worked. 
I know that this sounds obvious, but it was one argument of the authors of After Dark who said the following. People didn't really need After Dark. They were paying for the rarest of experiences. A product that could please, delight and surprise without crashing. Maybe it was due to the attention to details, the graphics and the user interface that made people want to have a copy of After Dark. Whatever it was, After Dark sold millions of copies and maybe one of those copies was yours. After Dark rose to fame due to the Flying Toaster's screensaver. And this is most probably also the one that stuck in your memory. But I will finish this video by showing you a screensaver that was one of the favorite modules of one of the authors because it most purely expresses the idea of After Dark. Starry Night Did you have a copy of After Dark or do you know someone who did? Were you mesmerized by the animations? Or do you think that After Dark was just overhyped? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.